Well, hello and welcome uh, to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. Uh, my name is Luke Stamps. I'm one of the directors at CBR. Uh, CBR is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the sake of contemporary Baptist renewal. Uh, if you like what you hear here, we ask you to uh, subscribe to our podcast on the various formats and to our YouTube channel as well. Well, we have an enormous privilege today uh, to welcome one of our heroes, really one of our CBR fellows, a supporter uh, in our work from the very beginning, uh, and really one of the key inspirations behind uh, what we do at CBR, Dr. Timothy George. So Dr. George is uh, the founding dean of the Beeson Divinity School in Sam at Sanford University in Birmingham, our home state of Alabama for Matt and me. Uh, and he now serves there as Distinguished Professor of Divinity at Beeson. He's the author of many books. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his uh, Theology of the Reformers, but many other great books uh, in, in church history and historical theology. He is a church historian, a preacher, an ecumenical theologian, and really one of the, the most inspirational leaders in the church today. And we are just enormously delighted to welcome him. So thank you, Dr. George, for joining us. I'm honored to be with you, Lucas. Well, one of the reasons why we had you on uh, for this particular episode uh, on Celtic spirituality, which is, you know, part of our 2023 reading challenge. And in previous years, we've done reading challenges on theology, on Baptist theology. This year, we focused on spirituality. And we chose uh, this book um, on Celtic spirituality. This is not the only uh, entry point into this literature, but it's a um, it's a, a larger collection of these primary sources. And the reason why we asked Dr. George uh, to join us for this is that the last time we saw you, Dr. George, in Denver, uh, you mentioned to us over dinner that you were going to be teaching a J-term class uh, at Beeson on, um, on Celtic spirituality. And so I wonder if you could just, to, as we begin, just tell us a little bit about what motivated that class, um, whether or not you had taught it before, if it's your first time, what you learn, what the students learn, how that class went for you. Sure. Well, I had a great teacher named George Hunston Williams at Harvard, and almost everything I've done or studied and written in one way or another is traceable back to him. Uh, he was a medievalist. He was an early church expert. He wrote a great book on the Radical Reformation, but he introduced me to Celtic Christianity. He had been a student of another great scholar, John T. McNeil, that some of our listeners will probably know because he's the one who edited with the help of Ford Lewis Battles, the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. But McNeil also early on wrote a book called The Celtic Churches. And he transmitted this interest in the Celts to George Williams and George Williams to me. And now I to my students this last January. I'd never taught it before. I've always been interested in Celtic Christianity. And particularly from some years ago when my son and I and another friend of ours, David Riker, a so graduate of Beeson Divinity School and a pastor now in Brazil, we three took a pilgrimage to a little place off the coast of County Kerry called Skellig Michael. It's just an island pointing out of the sea, 700 feet up from the depths of the ocean, this mountainous rocky crag. And this was a place where Celtic monks built beehive huts, we call them, and sheltered themselves from the wind and the rain and prayed and read and copied the scriptures and was an outpost of Christianity back during the very early Middle Ages. So we actually went there. It's not inhabited anymore, but uh, you could get a sea captain to take you out in a little boat. And that's what we did and spent the day there. And that greatly increased my interest in Celtic Christianity. What were these people doing there? What did they think they were doing? What, if anything, can we learn from them except to scratch our head and say what odd people these were? Yeah. But I do think there's some things we can learn from them. And I wanted to explore that in this course in January. That's great. And the students received it well? You had a good... Yes, they came every day with smiles on their faces at eight o'clock in the morning and worked hard and did well on the exams and everything. So by all accounts, they really enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. And I enjoyed it That's and great. learned a lot from it. Yeah, that's great. And I've learned a lot reading through this material uh, as well. I, I'm, I was some, you know, somewhat familiar with the Patrick um, stories and, and writings, but there's a lot in this particular volume that we looked at that was new to me. So it's been fascinating. Uh, one of the 
the things that's debated really around this topic of Celtic spirituality. And we actually had a friend uh, of ours sort of express this when we first posted this particular book that, that, that is there really such a thing as Celtic spirituality? If there is, do we really understand uh, the language and, and literature uh, enough to say what's distinctive of it? I know like there's been a, a sort of renewal of interest in Cel Celtic spirituality um, for a variety of reasons by different groups, even back to the emerging church from 20 years ago, kind of tapping into uh, Celtic spirituality. So there are questions really about who the Celts were, what united mm -hmm. them, with, mm -hmm. whether or not there's a distinctive spirituality um, in, in this literature. Where, where do you stand on those kinds of issues? Is there such a thing as Celtic spirituality? And if so, what are some of its key features? The most uncontroversial thing you could say about Celtic Christianity is that it's really controversial <laughs> because there's not any agreement on so many of these issues. First of all, who were the Celts? Well, they weren't from Ireland. I mean, they ended up in Ireland and other places along the edge of Europe, but they were originally from the heartland in Europe, from places like Austria and Germany and uh, some of the early um, Neolithic period that we study in archeology span because we don't have any literary remains take us back to a people that are strong, warlike, fierce, those kind of words come to mind. Uh, they were warrior, they were warrior class. And eventually they were pushed further and further west to the very edge of continental Europe. One of the bastions of Celtic Christianity is in France, what is today France, uh, a, a province called Brittany, the very edge extrudes into the Atlantic Ocean. That was a bastion of the Celts. And then over to Britain and eventually to the edges of Britain, to the north, there were the Picts, they were called, that's the Scottish people. And then in the south, there were the, the, the Cornish, Cor Cornwall today, the Welsh, that's a Celtic uh, people, and eventually into Ireland. They, they were pushed further and further and further to the very edge of the world. And that gave, I think, a certain kind of austere cast to their culture as well as their Christianity. And that comes out when you read the, their practices. One of the things to say about Celtic Christianity is that it was never conquered by the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rome, uh, Romans got to England, what we call England today, Britain. And eventually, though, they were, they were stopped. They couldn't ex go any further north than Hadrian's Wall. And then uh, they were never, ever able to conquer Ireland. They thought about it. One of their generals looked over and could almost see Ireland from the edge of England. Wouldn't it be great if we could go over there and take that land? But they were distracted by a few other things, and they never did it. Ireland was never conquered by Rome. There was never a Roman road in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that give it, gave it a kind of independence, a kind of uniqueness among all the places where Christianity took root. Mm -hmm. And so when the gospel came to Ireland, when you began to have people like Patrick and others, uh, they develop a very distinctive cast to their Christianity. And that's what, when I say Celtic Christianity, that's what I'm talking about. Now, let me just for a second uh, try and answer to your question about everything that passes under the name of Celtic Christianity isn't necessarily the gospel. In fact, uh, I would say one of the challenges that I had in this course and that anyone has who studies Celtic Christianity from a historic Orthodox, much less a Protestant evangelical tradition as I try to do, uh, you're gonna confront all kinds of weird things about Celtic Christianity. Uh, we used to call it the New Age movement. The New Age has gotten old, so it's not so new anymore. But the, the idea of blowing in the wind and hugging the trees and this kind of nature worship, which is a part of the old pagan tradition that was there in Ireland before Christians came, it's still around today in different forms. And sometimes that passes as Celtic Christianity. Uh, it's nothing of the sort. One of the things uh, Patrick was trying to do was to dispel that and set forth a different, let's say, more historically centered, orthodox, biblical understanding of Christianity. And that's really what I was interested in, digging into these Celtic saints and the kind of Christian life that they were able to bring together on that desolate place at the edge of the world. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
let's talk a little bit about Patrick, uh, who you mentioned there. Uh, hopefully this podcast will air during March. That's that's not uh, unintentional. Um, when we celebrate um, the life of St. Patrick on the 17th. Um, fascinating figure, Patrick, sold into slavery, missionary uh, to the Irish. Um, could briefly tell us a little bit about what we can reliably say about the life of St. Patrick and what contribution he makes to Christian spirituality more generally. Well, Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland, but he was not Irish. Uh, he was born in what we would call today England, Britain. I'm not sure exactly where. He gives us the name of his town, but that's never been located by archaeologists. Somewhere in Britain, he, he grew up not in dire poverty. His father was what was called a decurion. That was the same kind of office that the father of St. Augustine in, in Hippo in Africa had. Uh, we would probably say middle class, maybe upper middle class. They had a villa. Uh, and so he grew up in relative prosperity uh, in England on something of a, a farm out in the countryside with, with servants to help them and so forth. Uh, that's where we first see him. And he tells us that he was brought up in a nominal Christian home. That is, his, his father was actually a, uh, a deacon in the church. His grandfather had been a priest. So he comes from this kind of background, but his entire life is suddenly disrupted when almost out of the blue, it seems, when you read this, uh, that part of England was invaded by uh, people who had come from Ireland seeking slaves. This was an age of slavery. And that's one of the things, a very important thing about Patrick. He was born a slave and later comes to oppose slavery. One of Maybe one of the very first people we know in Western uh, Christendom who opposed slavery was St. Patrick. And he's taken as a slave to Ireland. Again, we're not sure exactly where. Uh, somewhere we probably think maybe around the county of Sligo. And here he is a shepherd. And he stays for a number of years out in the fields, subject to all kinds of weather extremes, the hail and the frost, the snow. He talks about that. And in the midst of that, uh, he remembers what he had heard as a young child back in England uh, from the church where he attended. And, and the voice of scripture comes to him and he is actually he turns to God. He cries out to God. Uh, he, he describes himself this way in his confession. He says, I was like a stone stuck in the mud, helpless, encased in mud and God by his grace came and rescued me, lifted me out. So one of the things about Patrick that's so fascinating is that he has this overwhelming sense of deliverance, of rescue, of divine grace that works through all of the circumstances in his life. And so after this experience, he escapes. He walks some 200 miles from where he is, in the Northern part of Ireland apparently, all the way to the edge of the southern part of Ireland, he gets on a boat and goes back to Ireland, back to Europe. And that begins another great turning point. I think he was so glad to be back with his family. Who wouldn't be after an experience like that? He didn't have any thought of doing anything else outside of Ireland, but he had a vision. And here's something I want to say to the listeners. If you study Celtic Christianity, you're going to come across these visions, these people who have dreams and visions and Christ appears to them, just sort of like it is in the Bible, you know. Uh, and that happened to Patrick. He had a vision and, and a man was there and saying, come over, holy boy, and walk with us again. Called him holy boy. Mm -hmm. Come over, holy boy, and walk with us again. And he took that to be a call from God through this vision that he was to return to Ireland, the place where he'd been a slave, and proclaim the gospel and bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. And so that is exactly what he does. After a few twists and turns along the way, I sort of think myself that he probably spent some time on the continent of Europe. Uh, there may be one of the monasteries or, or the places where Christian learning was thriving in that period. Remember, that's the time we're talking about. Uh, Patrick returns to Ireland after his slavery in the year uh, 432 or so, around that time. 
That's just after St. Augustine of Hippo had died. That's roughly equivalent to the lifespan of Attila the Hun. Hmm. The barbarian invasions are under swing. Uh, the Roman Empire has fallen already and since that Rome was uh, sacked in 410 and soon will, will crumble further. This is the world in which Patrick is born, grows up, and is called to serve God. It's a world uh, of transition. And that's one of the great themes in Patrick's writing. At the edge of the world means two things. It, at the edge of the world geographically, because Ireland is stuck out there in the Atlantic Ocean further than anything else from the continent of Europe you can get to before you come to North America. And at the edge of the world eschatologically, hmm. at the edge of time. And Patrick firmly believed that what he was doing in carrying the gospel back to the Irish people was a part of God's plan of redemption, that he would use that somehow to bring about the end of the world, the coming again of Christ. There's a real apocalyptic theology at work in, in Patrick. And that comes through in other places in Ireland as well. Mm. That's, that's really good. One of the texts that I uh, had read previously has always stood out to me is um, his Lorica, the breastplate yeah. uh, prayer. Um, and I, I think about this in terms of one, one of my favorite movies is a movie called To the Wonder, um, written directed by Terrence Malick. Uh, but in that movie, one of the, the, one of the characters is a priest um, played by Javier Bardem, who, as he's ministering to the broken people in that in there in that in this texas town uh he's he's praying the, the voiceover is, is is the prayer of of saint patrick the lorica christ uh before me christ behind me christ to my right christ to my left and so on so um that that text has always stood out to me it's a wonderful prayer the breastplate that's what lorica means the breastplate of saint patrick there are a number of these breastplates by the way he's not the only one but he's the most famous one and you quoted part of it Here, here's another part I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I mean, there's a power and a beauty and a rhythm in those words. I rise today through the strength of Christ's birth with his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion with his burial, through the strength of his resurrection with his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom, you see, it begins with the Trinity. So Patrick's theology is inherently Trinitarian from beginning to end. And remember the Council of Ephesus, uh, the Council of Chalcedon, all this stuff is happening around this very same time. Uh, we, we know Nicaea was 325, so that's already been established. And so he is buying into promulgating and spreading a Trinitarian faith at the edge of the world. And this is true of uh, the whole tradition of Irish Christianity uh, is very Trinitarian. And then he comes, you often hear a lot about creation in Irish Christianity. Um, and it has its pagan fringe, we have to acknowledge that. But listen today, I rise through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind, the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth, and the firmness of rock. Mm. Here's a person who's aware of the world, who can see it, who can touch it, who can see the fingerprints of God in some ways all around him. And this is a cause for adoration and praise, not to nature itself. That would be a, a false move, and not a kind of nature mysticism, but a praise of the creator the one the, who made nature, the creator of creation. Patrick calls him, and that this one is not only distant from us, almighty, omnipotent, we, we would say sovereign, the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth, but he also is eminent. He is a God who is with us. In that passage you were quoting, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, beneath me, above me, on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Just think about that. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. 
Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Yeah. Here's a kind of Christocentric view of the world, of salvation, and of salvation history. And I think that's something that we, we need more of in our world today. We're drawn away in so many other kind of uh, creation motifs that leave out the centrality of Jesus Christ. Mm. And Patrick puts it right where it ought to be at the heart of everything that breathes and moves and is. Yeah, that's good. I wonder if you could say something maybe about how, um, what, you know, what lessons we might learn in terms of contextualization, the sort of indigenizing of Christianity uh, in, in a particular place. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned there's this, there's a kind of pagan background uh, that comes through in, in these texts. I mean, we even, you know, think about like the, the Bridget tradition where there's this pagan goddess who sort of also functions as a Christian saint and is kind of vaguely related to uh, the Virgin Mary as well. Um, so there, there's some things that, that kind of get quirky around this. But at the same time, you still see, uh, even in that Patrick prayer, uh, that sort of uh, maybe redeeming the best of, of some of that uh, emphasis on, on nature, on creation, and putting it into a Christian register. So I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on yeah. how Christianity indigenous. Sort of like a choice, I think, when you look at, at the world of paganism. That's what we're talking about here, This uh, the Bridget traditions that present her as a goddess. I was there before Christianity came, and Christianity came, and it has to be said, I think, absorbed some of that motif, but there was a real Bridget, I believe, a real woman who did things for God and cared for others very deeply, and in some ways modeled the virtue of hospitality about as well as anybody I know in that period of time, and it's very hard sitting as we are in the 21st century to look back and sift through what is genuine, what is real, what is historical, as opposed to these myths and accretions that come along. But you know, we do that all the time in, in Christian history. Uh, when I, I grew up in a family of, I guess you would call me a fundamentalist, I probably still am, but um, we were taught not to have Christmas trees anywhere mm -hmm. in the church, in our home, because it was pagan. And there is a passage in the Bible that speaks to that, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 talks about people who go to the forest and chop down a tree and decorate it with all kinds of silver things and bring it to their house, just like our Christmas tree tradition. Well, one way to read that is to say, let's do away with all Christmas trees. They're of the devil. They're pagan. What do we have to do with them? We worship a God who is spirit, not tree. And there's, we need to hear that voice, that we be very careful that you know these things become idols. That's the danger in the Bible, isn't it? that we treat as God something which is not God. Be very careful. But at the same time, the tree represents something very holy and special and important for Christians. It represents the cross on which Jesus Christ died. And therefore, no one could see a tree, any tree, anywhere in the world without immediately being reminded that he was crucified on a tree. And so therefore, we can't just throw all the trees away. We've got to redeem the trees. We've got to, we've got to take all the paganism we can and, and throw it in the fireplace and let that burn up if we can, but keep the true create, creative meaning of that that was there, put there by God in the beginning. That's mm -hmm. what I think. Uh, and that's true of a lot of the stuff we find in the Celtic tradition as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's jarring to us Protestants. You know, I'm a Calvinist, and so people like me that uh, have been taught to be very suspicious and wary of things that are painted and pictures and so forth. You've got to be careful. And I still think that's true. We do have to be very careful. But I think it can also be redeemed in a way that it can bring honor and glory to God. And here I have to say, I, I take my stand with the Seventh Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II, which said that uh, things can be painted to represent Jesus Christ because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's, it's fundamentally a Christological point mm -hmm. that was being made there and that I think is being made here. But that's not to say we go in naively, blindly, taking everything on board without uh, critique. We can't do that. Right. Uh, we live in a world that's too much fallen for that to happen. Right. Yeah, that's good. 
So another uh, section in the book that we recommended on this, and again, there's more text than just these, but uh, one of the sections is on theology. So uh, kind of some interesting choices um, in the, the Davies collection. Um, one is Pelagius, right, who we all are familiar with uh, in his controversy with St. Augustine, um, but some others as well, Columba, um, also John Scotus, Eriugena, Ere, Ere um, and his uh, hom homily on the prologue to John's gospel. So as we kind of think about the theology of, of Celtic uh, Christianity, you know, you've mentioned um, the doctrine of the Trinity is, is important uh, for Patrick and others. What are some other um, ways you might describe the, the theology represented here and what it might have to teach us today? Well, the Trinity is the most important, I think, is a thoroughly Trinitarian understanding of Christianity coming just at the time when the doctrine of the Trinity had been solidified and, and finalized in the sense that the conciliar decisions had been made. Uh, along with that, Christology, which we've also talked briefly about, a lively sense of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, humanity, divinity. Uh, they're both affirmed in this tradition. Uh, also, I, I would say uh, grace. Uh, I talked briefly about Augustine. I think it's very interesting that these two people uh, overlap perhaps just a few years. They didn't know each other. We have no evidence of that. But that uh, Augustine of Hippo has a tremendous impact on Patrick and the, we could call it patrician tradition in Ireland. The, the grace-filled, grace emphasis again and again, over against Pelagius. Now, the section in this book, we're not 100% sure that's from the real historical Pelagius. It may be, and it has some good things in it. You know, heretics can say good things occasionally, mm -hmm. and this, this does too. Uh, but also, there's what we call pseudo-Pelagius, and people who pick up his name and write in his name. Uh, if I had to give a critique of some of the, let's say, outer extremes of Celtic theology along this line, John Scotus Erigena, you mentioned a Neoplatonist theologian at this time, it would be that they need a tougher, more robust sense of the fall and of sin uh, because the, the other doesn't work really without it. Trinitarianism, Augustinianism, you need a strong sense of the fallenness of the world as well as the beauty and the fact that it is a creature of God. Uh, and sometimes you get that in the Celtic, uh, particularly the saints' lives. And then later in the penitentials, we haven't talked about them, but there are these rules of how to pray and confess your sins that have a great influence on Western penitential theology. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. And uh, this uh, is something that we probably need more of, not less of, in our world today. Uh, because sin is a very un disagreeable topic, and you can't go deeply into the Irish Celtic Christianity without being confronted with your own personal sin and the sin of the community. Mm. These are both involved and requires repentance. Now, some of the steps they took to, to spell that out uh, go beyond what we would recommend necessarily, uh, but it, I, I always am cautious with my students and say, be careful not to just to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and, and, but what can you learn from this way of praying and this way of being aware of your sinfulness and your need for God? Um, the discipline of prayer, the praying so many times a day, which of course later becomes the tradition of the, of the hours of the daily office in the monastic tradition. There's the, all of that that's there uh, that I think is recoverable in a good way. Now, it should, should be said uh, that, you know, at the time of the Reformation, there were a lot of people who wanted to go back and reclaim Patrick and reclaim the Irish tradition as being proto-Protestant. Hmm. Because as I said before, it never kind of fell under the sway of the Roman uh, Empire and the Roman Catholic tradition was always a little bit uh, at, at the bay when it came to the Irish form of things. Even today, I think that's true to some extent. And so um, I think uh, we have to be careful not, not to throw everything out, but to try to appropriate what we can. Mm, that's good. Well, uh, one final question as we kind of wrap up here. 
what are some of the main reasons why uh, busy pastors, thoughtful Christians, even Baptists like us, uh, <laughs> should read this literature? Like, why should a Baptist care about uh, this ancient uh, Celtic spiritual spirituality literature? What is the contribution uh, that it makes to our spirituality? And maybe what are some other resources you would point uh, our yeah, listeners to? Sure. Well, these are all our speaking cousins. Uh, they belong to the family. It's like a family reunion. You know, you've got all the kinds of people, the ones who pick their teeth and don't comb their hair and then the ones that dress up real nice. They're all, they're coming to the family picnic. Mm -hmm. And these are all the people who are at the picnic. We, we, we can't dismiss any of them. We have something to learn from all of them. If none of them is exactly the model we want to follow in every respect. So uh, I would say my word of encouragement would be uh, learn the breadth of your family, learn, learn the people, your, who your cousins are and how they have lived and the struggles they had and how they came through so many of them and were triumphant by God's grace. I do wanna mention a couple of good resources that I think might, might be interesting um, to our listeners. One is a brand new, I think within the last year or two, uh, edition of St. Patrick's Confession. And we that's singular, confession. We usually say Augustine's confessions, plural. But uh, Patrick wrote a confession. He wrote it in Latin. We have the Latin text that's come down to us. And this is a new edition, a new translation of it, uh, edited by Patricia Colling Egan. And it's a little different. I mean, when you read it, you'll see that it doesn't just follow the traditional way of thinking about it. But um, you can't read it without kind of being uh, caught up in the mystique and the power of Patrick and his witness and what he was trying to do. So I recommend that for anybody that wants a good, accessible um, edition of Patrick's major writing. And by, by the way, this is the first major writing in Christian Latin that we have outside the Roman Empire, hmm. the first one, and one that has a tremendous influence, not only in Ireland, but really throughout uh, the whole Christian family. The other book I want to mention is by a friend of mine, uh, Michael Haken. Michael Haken teaches church history at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He lives also in Canada and has worked there. He's a remarkable theologian, I think one of our best Baptist historians, written a lot about the Reformed Baptist tradition and kind of post-Reformation Protestantism, but he has a book called Patrick of Ireland, His Life and Impact. It is published by Christian Focus in Scotland. It's, it's not a long book, but it's a very good book, a little over 100 pages. I recommend it to anybody who wants to get their toes in the water on Patrick without maybe doing a deep dive. It's very good. Mm. Michael Haken, Patrick of Ireland, his life and impact. Uh, those are two I would recommend just for people that want to uh, say well, what's out there that I, I can read. And then the collection you mentioned, the Celtic Christianity, you have to sort of read it judiciously. It has a lot of things in it uh, that you, you might not want to read in great depth unless you're interested in it. One of the things it has is the lives of the saints. Mm -hmm. these, these Celtic saints uh, we've mentioned uh, Bridget already. She's one of them. Patrick, of course, the life of Patrick. Uh, but there are a number of others. Columba, Columbanus. One thing we haven't mentioned about the Celts today that we ought to, especially on this, this uh, uh, podcast, and that is how missionary focused they were. Mm -hmm. You know, they carried the gospel all the way back uh, to the continent of Europe. Figure like Columbanus. Uh, planted churches uh, in places that still stand today, Bobbio in Italy, Fulda in Germany, St. Gallen in Switzerland. Uh, these were Irish church plants, we might say, mm. and they had a tremendous influence on the development of Christianity in the Middle Ages and beyond. We can still learn from them today. So this idea that you, you don't have all these wonderful spiritual riches and you just harbor them and hoard them to yourself. Uh, that's not why God gives them to us, but to release them into the world and from the very edge of the world to carry the gospel back to the heart of the world. That's what they did. And that's what we're called to do too as missionary Christians. Amen. 
Dr. George, thank you so much for this. Very informative, very helpful uh, guide to our readers and our listeners on this. Again, thank you so much for uh, your inspiration to the work that we do. It's been a privilege to speak to you today. Thank you, Lucas.